Philippa Davis went through the trauma and grief of losing a baby during pregnancy five times over nine years. Now she's aiming to help other parents going through the same experience of loss by setting up a charity. She's called it Our Sam after her daughter, who was stillborn in 2012. Losing these babies nearly did destroy me. I, I went from being a postgraduate scientist, lecturer, somebody who's worked with sporting people most of my life, very capable, um, to somebody who couldn't go shopping, you know, and I struggle to wake up some mornings, you know, in terms of did I actually want to wake up? Um, but, you know, you, you keep going, you know, you make that choice. Hopefully now I can use my experience to afford and help other parents. It's early days and the pandemic is not helping, but Philippa believes there are many parents who might need help and support. We know, going by ONS statistics um, and also that estimate, that between 2015 and 2018, across Wales and just Northern England, 148,000 pregnancies and babies were lost. It is a project as close to her heart as anything can be. It's the one thing that I could do with the children I couldn't have. You know, that this, I can in a way do this with Sam, um, who I couldn't do anything with in real life. So, you know, they, they she gives me probably the strength to, to keep going each day and the inspiration. Ian Lang, ITV News. Um, just tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so, um, our Sam came about because um, I, I am a mum, um, but not in the normal sense of the word. Um, I have gone through um, the awful trauma of baby loss. Um, our daughter Sam was born asleep. She was still born in January 2012. And over the last nine years, she is one of five babies that I've lost as a result at different stages of pregnancy. Um, so that's where it stemmed from and I really struggled, I battled my way through, um, having never had any problems with mental health before, um, I struggled to was diagnosed with depression, anxiety and ultimately post-traumatic stress disorder. But despite all of that, um, I really struggled to get the right support, it took me nearly three years to get the right support. Um, the mainstream healthcare, whilst they're fantastic people, that the answer was antidepressants, which I really didn't want because at the end of the day, my baby still wouldn't be there when I came off them. And I felt it was going to cause me personally, it was going to cause me more problems. Um, and also having been, <coughs> having been referred to mainstream general counsellors um, on a number of different occasions, um, I was, at each time I was referred, I was told that they were out of their depth, that, um, you know, they didn't know what to do with me. This was a specialist area. And the problem is when you're already so low and feeling like a failure, then when, when a professional says to you, they feel like a chocolate teapot or um, they, you know, they're out of their depth, then in the end you have to resort to your own tactics of trying to cope um, which for me was avoidance which ultimately then led to phobia so by the time I received the help I needed um, you know it took a long time to do that but Hope House Hospice came along and I had I received counselling and support through them for, for three years on and off through um, kind of the final three uh, babies that we lost and through depression and trying to come back from this. So this was where it came from and in addition I'm a writer so part of my coping strategy as well as avoidance was to uh, write. So I wrote children's stories, children's books which for me I suppose helped that gap in my life, helped that hole in my life. But when I actually finally started counselling, my counsellor was aware that I was a writer. And as we progressed, um, and she started getting me out of four walls, um, because at the time I couldn't even go shopping, I couldn't walk down the street, I couldn't function. Um, I, I went to work and put a mask on, but I wasn't in an environment where there were going to be any triggers. So outside of that, 
I basically locked myself up because I didn't feel I fitted. So Hope House were fantastic, even to the point of coming shopping with me to try and get me over this phobia that I'd created through avoidance. But when my counsellor was aware that I was a writer, she had said to me, it would be fantastic if at some point when you feel ready, you can get your story on paper. Um, that would be brilliant. Um, so in the end, I thought I'd never be able to do it. Never. Um, however, as we headed towards the end of counselling, I decided that I suppose almost as a thank you to them, but also to try and raise awareness for other parents not to repeat my journey or to at least reduce the repetition of my journey i decided to head back to theater which is where i kind of started many many years ago and i wrote a play called dancing in the wings and that is based on the whole story um, from fertility treatment ivf because sam was an ivf baby through the loss of sam and beyond our battle to try and survive and cope with you know, the depression that I'd gone through. And I was really lucky because we had a huge amount of support through Betsy Cabal, the health board, um, through Theatre Cluid, uh, Liam Evans Ford, the executive director there. Um, and we had a lot of support, I had a lot of support to write it. Um, and it was finally staged at the start of this year at Theatre Cluid, which is fantastic. And although the run was cut short because of COVID, as most things, um, we are actually going to be running it online at the start of 2021, which is fantastic. Um, but basically, at the end of that, I had such a huge response through reviews and through healthcare professionals, through parents, just general audience members, um, as to kind of seeing the full story. You know, I, I was told by a midwife, um, you know, this is going to change the way you work. And having had so many requests to take it further, I decided I needed to do something. I needed to use what I had and expand that to help other parents because this had a big effect on those that were there to support them um, and raise the issues. So at the start of this year, um, when I also became unemployed, <laughs> I spent six months um, developing uh, the application for charity status and developing the plan to go forward. And we achieved charity status in September, which is brilliant. Um, so we're now kind of at that stage where we're just starting to develop initiatives um, pending funding <laughs> um, and going forward, taking Dancing in the Wings and taking other creative projects as well as education research um, and training for people who are supporting um, you know maybe in a mainstream way uh, who come into contact with people who are affected by baby loss uh, to trust to try and help. I notice I read your notes and you mentioned the thing that this is a in many ways this is still a taboo subject in the 21st yeah. century it's still a it's still a, a taboo subject yes i think in the same way as mental health was for a very very long time one of the biggest problems with baby loss is that it's an invisible loss so to um you know prior to not so much neonatal death obviously but up to the point where the baby you know hasn't yet been born that that loss is not seen by anybody outside those immediately involved, the parents, which means that there is a lack of understanding as to the level of grief experienced by those parents because people don't really understand how you can grieve. Whilst they, they have a sympathy, they don't really understand how you can grieve so deeply something, someone who was invisible to the rest of the world. And I think that's one of the biggest problems, a bit like mental health is a hidden illness. Baby loss is a hidden loss, but it's happening to so many people. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, we know that one in four pregnancies are lost between conception and shortly after birth. Um, we know, going by ONS statistics, 
um, and also that estimate that between 2015 and 2018, across Wales and just Northern England, 148,000 pregnancies and babies were lost. And that's over a three year period. And from that, approximately 28,000 can be attributed to North Mid Wales and just over the border into Chester. That is a huge number of people who are affected. And whilst not all of them are going to need or want professional support, every one of them needs that emotional support and that understanding um, that the level of grief is real and the subsequent mental health problems that can occur and that isolation, feeling that you don't belong anymore, it, it's very real for people. Yeah, the, the themes in, in, in culture, motherhood, is, is such, such a powerful, all-consuming theme, isn't it? Well, it's, I mean, the thing is, you know, people have babies every day. It's the most normal thing in the world for mums and dads. And I think that's also something that's, you know, important to note is the fact that this isn't just about mums, you know, or, or, you know, what people see as the normal structure of a relationship. Anybody who parents a baby um, and goes through this loss, no matter what culture or structure or anything else it, it, the the same grief and the same pain is involved and it, it's such an isolating thing because they say baby you know birth of a baby is a normal thing that's what we do so to not be able to do that or to not be able to protect that child in pregnancy is it, it's just horrendous and you know shouldn't happen to anybody but sadly is just so common what do you hope that you know this interview will do i mean what is your 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 vision for what might happen in the next stage of the charity i think i mean there are a number of things we've just launched our first first creative project so we have two arms to our charity one is the education research and training side and the other one is using which will have a crossover but the other one is using creative um media through popular media of real stories of people's loss, starting with our own, because it would only be fair to do that, um, that it will open the door to baby loss, that, you know, it, it will help people, whilst you can't understand fully unless you've experienced it, by opening the door to it, you're allowing people to at least part way experience what you go through, and therefore have a greater understanding. So I think one of the things we want to achieve, obviously, is that understanding. We also want to reduce kind of the fear of conversation and the fear, this, this taboo that, that is there at the moment that we managed to overcome with mental health, but we still got a long way to go with baby loss. And the third thing is to reduce isolation. Um, you know, so many parents feel so isolated and this year in particular with COVID, you know, there are parents who are having to go through giving birth to a stillborn baby on their own and they are away from their immediate support network. And so whilst COVID has caused all sorts of problems in terms of things like funding, because funding is incredibly difficult for everybody right now, but it COVID doesn't stop babies dying and it doesn't reduce the number of babies dying or the people who are suffering. What it's done is it's exacerbated the mental health, the distress um, that is experienced by parents because they're away from support. And whilst the fantastic charities who provide counselling support out there are still doing that as best as they can at a distance and still need that support, um, you know, it, it is such a horrendous year for everybody, but for people losing babies it's just yeah it's incredibly tragic if somebody is out there going through this horrendous experience how can they contact you okay so whilst we ourselves are not a direct um counseling um support service what we what we focus on doing is trying to kind of highlight the services that are out there in the signposting um so People are more than more than welcome to contact us at on our through our website, which is oursam.org.uk, 
um, and we are more than happy to signpost people who are in you know distress because you know there are fantastic organizations like sans uk like tommy's um, lots of smaller organizations as well hope house hospice who provided me with counseling there are lots of organizations and we are more than happy to signpost but we also have projects that maybe for people who are feeling isolated so for example we've just set up our stars choir which so far has attracted parents from across the uk um, many mums at this stage um, but the whole point behind this is that it is an outlet that is not just about baby loss but it's about social interaction and about being together and about having fun as well because that's something that bereaved parents really struggle with you know are we allowed to have fun and this is kind of in a structured environment um, so we start our first rehearsal on tuesday evening but we've still got a couple of spaces left if if anybody would like to join us um, that will be fantastic and they'll, that will run uh, with the support of um, our musical director Anne Harrod Edwards who has experienced loss herself but has given her time as an experienced musician to come along and direct the choir um, and we're also Sands UK are coming along on the first night um, to talk about their support so that there is support there for any choir members who may need it you know not so much as a result of the choir, but may need it as, as an ongoing process. So our, our role, I suppose, is more signposting role and also trying to bring parents together to reduce isolation. And I suppose, you know, it's early days yet, but you know, if you get the funding, that branch, the counselling thing, because it's like, it's, you're right, it's, it's, it's expertise, it's employing the right people, that will come, but in time, because it's early days. Yeah. I mean, our, our, our plan with the, um, we, what we're trying to get funding for at the moment are, are resources and projects that will allow us to go out there and produce um, systems, resources for um, very, very kind of inclusive signposting and also training and awareness training, but not kind of working with healthcare, but also guidance professionals, HR, maybe police, coroners, anybody who, who is guiding people who may be affected by baby loss to raise their understanding and we will use creative media as part of our training to do that. So we're trying to raise funds to create those initial resources that we will also be able to deliver digitally. So can COVID or no COVID, we can do this. Um, <clears throat> And then, yes, in the long term, we can look at the possibility of, of counselling support. But I think initially what we need to do is raise that understanding, reduce that taboo and try and help people access the right support when they need it most. I think you're a very courageous person. I think you are. Thank you. I mean, I suppose it's the one thing that I could do with the children I couldn't have, you know, that this... I can in a way do this with Sam, um, who I couldn't do anything with in real life. So, you know, they, they, she gives me probably the strength to, to keep going each day and the inspiration. You know, if it hadn't been for her, I, I wouldn't be doing this now, um, you know. But yeah, that's what I'd say, courageous, but you're turning something very, very bad into something good. It's a transformative process, isn't it? It's, it? it's not allowing, it's not allowing things to destroy you because, you know, I'm in, in my business, I see that a lot, but it's saying, this is not going to destroy me. I'm going to become, show my strength yeah. and help I others. Mean, this is wonderful. It's great. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of the best motivations. It's what defines us, the good parts of humanity, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it, you know, losing these babies nearly did destroy me. I, I went from being a postgraduate scientist, lecturer, somebody who's worked with supporting people most of my life, very capable, um, to somebody who couldn't go shopping, you know, and I struggle to wake up some mornings, you know, in terms of did I actually want to wake up? Um, but, you know, you, you keep going, you know, you make that choice <clears throat> and you keep going. 
um, and hopefully now I can use my experience just to move forward and my skills as well to, to move forward and help other parents, um, you know, wherever they might be. So this is, a, like I said, this is the beginning, isn't it? Yes, very much, very much. Yeah, it's um, yeah, very early stages. So it's very exciting for us right now. Um, but as I say, one of the one of the biggest issues for us is that fundraising, because not only is this year such a difficult year for everybody, but as a new charity, it's also incredibly difficult um, to secure funding. Um, and then in baby loss as well, <clears throat> which, you know, is just a subject that it's not, you know, it's not one of those sexy subjects people want to fund, you know.